Do you have auto tune turned on right now? Bad. <laughs> wow. wow. I had to turn my. Uh... Okay, yeah, it's off now. Okay, there's the human inflection. Is that better? <laughs> oh my gosh, that would have been embarrassing. <laughs> oh, that is better. Yeah, that is smoother. Wow. <laughs> I apologize if I'm looking here because my screen is here, the camera's here, so it's I'm gonna okay. look like I'm. It's that professional look, you know, where like oh, you got a side it's... camera. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian McKinnon, a singer, songwriter, producer. Um, I've worked on songs, and uh, yeah, one of them's on what we're gonna be working on today. It's been a while since I heard such a cohesive album like this. Mm. I don't know if everyone would agree. Um, I know everybody has all kinds, that's the thing about music is that it has a lot of different you know, uh, aspects. People have a lot of different opinions on the matter. Mm -hmm. But I think that this was a very, very well put together album. This, this collection of music, I, even from the order in which the songs were put, um, that was very meticulous and you can tell a lot of thought went into it. You know, from the slower songs to the quicker songs. All that stuff was very, very uh, deliberate, and I think it was. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a work of art. I know it sounds a little over the top, but no, I agree. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> I was actually struck speechless after almost every single song because I was so in awe of what I just heard. And so, to quote what Kevin actually put on Twitter about Criminal, I felt like mm. each song was incredibly raw. I never before had I been so drawn to a vocal part instead of instrumental. His ah. singing in every single song had so much push and pull, so much dynamics. Like you don't always hear this much dynamic singing with um, leaning into stuff and then pulling away. You just really felt and kind of like rode out the motions that he sang. And yeah. I think it's just overall, it was a perfect emotional journey for me, which I will go into mm. more depth later. But Kevin, what are your thoughts? I know you you have a roller coaster of like, mm, yes, kind of. Know. Yeah, I found certain tracks to be very impressive. Half of those tracks, I actually focused more on the instrumentals than mm. the vocals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I okay. because Criminal was such a good starting track, and he was able to do something so simple with his voice. I was ready to see what he would do with the rest of the album, and there were some tracks where I did notice a lot of great stuff going on with his with his vocals but for some reason near yeah the the second half of the album e on the tracks that i did like even i f the things i liked were mostly instrumental mm -hmm. i guess it, it it's I, I'm, I'm guessing it's more of a personal thing because sometimes yeah melody like what i consider a good melody is might be different from what other people consider a good melody and right. some of his melodies near the second half didn't didn't strike me as as much mm -hmm. yeah but so reserved appreciation with some amounts of passion but okay starting from the top criminal so to summarize my thoughts after listening to it several more times is it really does truly have a nice build and release in the final chorus because I went in and I wrote out all the notes for his new belted section over the final chorus because this is when just truly everything really releases and also Kevin by the way I never actually paid attention to the lyrics so I went in and I read the lyrics and you were right those are like whoa oh yeah <laughs> those are really intense lyrics but the <laughs> fact that in so the melody is mainly rotating between three notes E G and F sharp and then he comes in and he leaps up so that the interval is a fifth above. But I thought it was so smart to just take this one single line and go between unison and the sudden leaps and range. And that just made everything so much more explosive. Mm, nice. I love this song. I think the song is phenomenal. And it's it's because the whole experience is so pure. Um, I think the the mixing is so perfect in this song. And I, I definitely paid attention to the third chorus more, Umu, after you you, <laughs> you you pointed it out earlier. Yeah, and I liked I liked his stuff, but I don't think necessarily those were calculated inflections. I think mm -hmm. they he might have just been riffing. I I do think so. And there's a very nice 
like big picture going on. Like it starts kind of low, and then again the the pre yeah. the pre chorus has some upward scales that wave upward, and then the the, the yeah the chorus is very much that I'd like to call it the state of ecstasy that he's <laughs> sort of singing about, and he just just just. Yeah, it lingers there until the next section, and I love it. Yeah, sweet man. I think um, to your point, Kevin, is that the melody does tell a story. Like I don't, I don't know any of the, I don't know what's being said. Mm. I didn't really go on and sort of study the lyrics, but I know that there's something very passionate about what he's saying. Mm. I can tell melodically, and also it's a testament to Taman's delivery that oh, yeah. um, there's something very intense being conveyed mm -hmm. and. It's also simple things like the pre-chorus. It's just that 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 um, going up the scale and sort of a blues sort of scale, like mm -hmm. da, na, 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 na. like you can look at that as a very simplistic melody, but like there's something to be said about when something like that is being used, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, I think that was a perfect perfect example from a melodic standpoint when to use something like that because it was also Taman's crescendo. It was also the level of desperation on that last note when he holds it in his vibrato. Like, it's not just the notes, but the delivery as well. Um, and Taman just, he, he knocked it out of the park. Um, I am a sucker for anything that reminds me of Daft Punk. So, when you, Kevin, when you brought up uh, The Weeknd, I was like, oh, yeah, of course, because he had that that Daft Punk uh, collaboration mm. in his past works as well. So That's what it, no, it is Daft Punk. I was yeah. trying to pinpoint it because I said there is a bit of 80 synth pop in it, but it's not exactly that. And the moment right. you said Daft Punk, I'm like, no, that's it. Yeah. And I, yeah. And, and I know the fans, like, they don't like comparisons or anything. Well, I think that has to do with, like, K-pop groups. I mm -hmm. wouldn't compare any K-pop right. groups to this. But I, this reminds me of, like I said, Daft Punk and Kylie Minogue because of the La 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 mm. um, riff. Cause she's got a song that uses that as well but like it's not the same of course it's just but it's uh it's like a hint of it and mm -hmm. i always love like essences of things here and there mm -hmm. and this song was really good i get why it was chosen as a single because it's good and it's going to stand the test of time in my opinion oh yeah i agree um one other thing i really enjoy about it is in the chorus even though he's singing those very simple notes you hear the main sort of instrumental side riff the side melody which is some quick flourishing notes at the same time and usually because there are so many choruses where just one drop and then they might sing some fifths but the instrumentals are like the the it, it's usually like a balance like when do we bring the vocalist up when do we bring the instrumentalist up and i yeah. can't remember the last time where i could just hear both coexist in such a fashion and that's when i it was brought to my attention how perfect the mixing just where mm. everything the position and levels of everything is in that song yeah. Edson's got good, good mixers, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, moving on to Black Rose, I've actually wanted to start off some with some questions for you, Adrian, because okay. the main thing that popped into my mind is that this song has the perfect amount of tension and release and building up, and a lot of it comes from the chromaticism and, you know, just like the half-step movement. I was wondering... I know I've asked you before what is the importance of harmony, but I have never asked you what is the importance of chromaticism in music. I, I think I don't know. I don't know if I um, have ever looked at chromaticism like that as sort of a tool. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's um, a lot of times it's based on just like the feel in the moment. Okay. Um, having said that, I am aware that chromaticism is very it's very widely used within K-pop in general, um, and I think that's a great thing. I think it's really cool to be able to play. Uh, through different colors, basically, is what I think chromaticism is used for. Maybe anyway, that's if I, if it was a tool for anything, it would be that. That track produced by London Noise when it was present, I was I did it at a camp, and um, I worked on it with Dees, who's another. I've, I've mentioned Dees before, but he's like he's incredible. He's like he's a different kind of human. <laughs> <laughs> he's a different kind of human, Dees. But we both got these uh, Tim Burton, Danny Elfman, Graveyard. Like, I love how the uh, the stage performance had the women with the lace because that's exactly how I saw it in my head, you know. Um, I love also, like, Edward Gorey. He does, like, a lot of um, creepy kind of visuals and stuff. PBS mm -hmm. used to do that. I'm, 
I'm old. But PBS used to do these intros uh, for mystery, and it kind of had this weird sort of creepy artistic style. Anyway, that's that's the feeling we got, oh, yeah, and we I just went like in and black and white screen, and it like zooms in. Okay, yeah, I think I know what you're talking right? about. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like the old. <laughs> it was cartoon. It was animated, but that freaked me out, and I, and I loved being freaked out by stuff like that. And Danny Elfman is like one of my favorite composers. Mm-hmm. Period. Um, somebody I study a lot. So we tried to play with that. There was another big inspiration. It was actually more from a video game, Quackshot for Sega Genesis. It was a Donald Duck video game. And there was a level you played called Transylvania. And I'm getting, I'm going in too deep. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this game had a lot of uh, chromaticism within the song. I encourage, Kevin, actually you mentioned Song of Storms one time in one of the videos. This song reminds me of the Song of Storms from Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and also Majora's Mask. And uh, this song did that as well. You probably have to edit all this down. <laughs> oh no, I'm including everything. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know. Okay. But Quackshot was a huge inspiration. A lot of video game music is very inspiring and um, that was definitely part of our sort of creative melting pot of ideas that we put together there. Gotta check that out. I'm into video game music very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll happily send you a link. It's so Sweet. crazy. You did all such right. a lovely job. Go ahead. I gotta talk about this song. I gotta talk about this song. <laughs> okay, all right. So this song actually has one of, I like to call it a musical kryptonite. It's something that I, I'm usually guaranteed to dislike, and I'm guaranteed there, there there's a second half to this, but okay. um, it is that that low key latin inspired type of harmony that were like it, it's a it's that minor sort of edgy type of feeling i i know this song is not strictly latin it's a bit more orchestral and stuff i like this because it's just just everything really works and i really liked there was this one mel- melodic line where you instead of going down to like the root note, you go like one step further down. Da 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 da. It, it, you go down. To yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. That. So again, that oh. was okay. I'll have to send you this link. But okay. um, you're talking about uh, verse one. Uh, that line there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that it's things like that that I love I really try and, and find ways to uh, go mm. about a melody a little differently from what you would normally do I'm so yeah. glad that you pointed it's that so out. great I, I want to I kind of want to take back the chromaticism as a tool because I mm. think this might have been one of those prime times where we certainly did there was a there was a focus on creating a, a sort of creepiness mm. ma- maintaining that because mm. of the visuals that we kind of had and um, it was so nice to have Deez as a partner in that too because Sometimes I'll be in my head about something and be just totally lost in a jumble, and then he'll kind of unravel my craziness, mm-hmm. and uh, it makes for a great collaborative work. Yeah. I have to ask about the bridge. There's a crazy chord. Was it like an E minor yeah. or something? Uh, that was that was that was D's. That uh-huh. was D's going ham on chords so Deez is like uh i would almost say virtuoso but like he has um this ability to just have fun on keys Uh and at the time the track didn't have a bridge london noise know that Deez is crazy on keys i have never actually took the time to try and break down what that chord progression was that he did so i I don't have any details on that but Mm -hmm. i know that trying to work through the weeds of that and, and creating a melody over it was so much fun. Mm-hmm. I was going to so ask much you fun. about that. <laughs> when do you decide to highlight a note played in the instrumental and the vocals, and when do you decide to not? Like, it's just, it's just going with it, or do you think meticulously about that at all? A lot of times it's trial and error. I think a lot with a lot of songwriters, not everybody works the same way, but a lot of times you, you throw stuff at a wall to see if it sticks. Is as barbaric as that sounds, <laughs> um, I'm sure. I mean, there's a, there's more to it than that. But you listen to it a few times, and you just sing melodies that just that really they stick out to you. And I think it's a matter of catching those moments because you have to listen. You know, you have to listen while you sing, and if it feels right, you just go for it. It's basically what happened. But again, this goes back to Dee's being really. He kind of I think he took point on that one because it was his chord progression, so he kind of knew how to start. I think he launched it, and then a lot of those um, runs and things. I came in with that, but like, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So was it yeah. his voice or your voice in some of the oohs? Because there were a lot of thick harmonies. I heard Tame and Samber in some, but some of them I didn't recognize as um, his. I don't know what they ended up using, using. in the end, um, but I'm, I think some of my vocals are in there. 
Yeah. There's a high note in there. Um, I wouldn't want to point it out because I don't want to take away from any mystery. <laughs> but there is a high note in there that they that they held on to. But it was fun. It's kind of nice to have different uh, vocal textures. That being said, back to Taman. Um, I think that he is so good. I, I remember er, listening early on to a lot of his works and um, thinking that he had sort of this sort of subtlety to his voice. And that was about the that was the the, the, the gist of it. But in reality, he does this thing where he reserves his energy. He still has energy in the sort of softer tones in his voice. But when he does explode vocally, it really stands out. And I love that he kind of holds it back because he can really go. I know in a couple of interviews, he's sort of he doesn't think of himself as a really powerful singer. But if that's the case, I don't know if I believe that. But if that is the case, he does a really good job of like holding it back and then releasing to really to shock his listeners. And I think he, he did a really good job with it. Black Rose, especially the ad libs coming out of the middle eight. Mm. He really went for that that sliding. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. go way up yeah. there with that. I loved it. I I loved how Black Rose transitioned into Strangers. Kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, they they complement each other very well. Black Rose kind of had that sort of dramatic sort of strings and things, and and it was a good time. You didn't want to bring it back up just yet. So Strangers was able to give you that sense of uh, of hope. I think I said in, in our text conversation, Umu, that Black Rose had sort of a shadowy kind of grave feel, and Strangers with those chord, that chord progression kind of felt like the sun was coming up on whatever the situation was before. So if you're looking at like colors from what Black Rose was, Strangers was more like golden and it was like the sun was rising and kind of bringing you out of that feeling of despair or whatever Black Rose gave mm. people. Yeah, that chord progression reminded me of uh, a Kendrick track, uh, How Much a Dollar Cost from uh, To Print ah, the Butterfly. Right. Yeah, because it's got Another a similar piano, it's sort of like a two note bum bum. Yeah, the specific mm-hmm. tone is a little different, but I just... I, I just heard her right away, and I was Maybe, like, "Whoa, yeah. that that sounds like that sounds like to pimp a butterfly," mm-hmm. and yeah. I wonder if that's part of the inspiration. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, I was gonna ask you, what do you think about the chord progression, even though it's repeated these two, <laughs> or maybe I think sometimes it changes the second note. Oh no, mm-hmm. I'm listening to it right now. It changed the lower note. Um, <laughs> but oh. like the very rare changes in the chords, and yet it is so not boring to listen it's to. It's because it these chords really... are ambiguous. They're, you can interpret them in multiple ways. Like I, the sort of the, it's not concrete. You know, there's a mm. lot of ways to, it's like kind of major, kind of minor. Kind of minor. Something can be interpreted as a major seventh or like a ninth. There are many ways to go about these chords. And I really liked it. It's like, it almost forces my analytical brain to shut down for a bit and just really mm. enjoy the texture, which is an absolutely fascinating texture that I was able to, yeah, be along the ride for for the entire time. Yeah, so so talking about this song from an emotional standpoint, so the first two songs got us feeling in a very specific headspace, kind of dark, um, kind of mysterious, maybe even fantasy land of story. Story, something story-wise is happening, right? And then um, this song comes on, and that's when the tears started building up for me. I started feeling all the emotion that he was singing about. And I love the lyrics, strangers with memories. Something about yeah. that just got me choked up. And so yeah. the fact that we started with like pulling our heartstrings on this song, it really, I feel like the rise and fall of how I was pulled emotionally in this album was perfect. But the next song was definitely a little bit more grooving. So I didn't quite feel as heartstring pulled. Um, so this is the Latin song, Kevin, that yes, or, yes or the, the tango, right? Mm-hmm. It has like the castanets and yep. <laughs> I really liked his voice over this style because yeah. but I, what I loved about this song was the little beeps and boops of the Latin Spanish guitar. Mm, the flamenco. Just, yeah. yeah. Is that what it is? I wasn't yeah, sure that's whether what this the is style flamenco is called the flamenco. Okay. Yeah. Flamenco. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. The guitar style is flamenco. I, I, I'd say the track is more tango-y. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was fun. I, I think mm-hmm. it was a nice way to sort of, again, I guess coming back to sort of the, the layout of the album, mm-hmm. I get why it was placed where it was. 
to get you ready mm-hmm. for the next song, Famous. Um, mm-hmm. Not just that. I mean, it was a good song, in my opinion, yeah. <laughs> um, as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, I, I guess because I, I, I do love sort of the uh, vocal approaches to it because he does sort of the soft stuff. And then you kind of have this sort of edgy sort of like lower notes to come in. So I like the sort of dynamics and the vocals for the uh, pre-chorus. <laughs> I wanted to add another thing that I, what I liked about Waiting For is the highs and lows. Like Adrian talked a little bit about it, the highs and lows in the vocals, but in the track as well, like we start with this very high it's kind of like cute it's kind of playful and then at times we have this percussion that pans right and left and that's so incredibly punchy Mm. so i think the track does a good job of balancing playfulness and also really uh, rhythmic moments to keep it driving forward okay now moving forward add to famous so this was not the first time i had heard it Adrian, did you hear when it was first released, like the Japanese version? I did. I heard, well, I heard tidbits of it. I heard um, mostly the production. I remember when they were doing the promo videos. I remember seeing um, Taman moving and I was pretty, I was pretty, I was pretty jazzed. I was pretty excited about it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, My, I think the first time that I watched the video and heard the song, I was just so blown away by the dance moves that the song didn't really fully sink in. So even though today was like my 20th listen of the song, there were so many more things that I picked up upon because I wasn't looking at his amazing brain blowing moves. Um, and I didn't realize how cool the form was. You know yeah. how it goes, famous, I'm so fabulous, famous, da 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 da, and then it goes back to da 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 da. And then the next time the chorus returns, it goes, famous, famous. Da-da. Da-da. famous yeah. yeah and then the da 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 doesn't appear until da 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 and then it goes da 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 mm-hmm. so it it almost in a way like plays the chorus front to ba- back and then back to front second time through mm. which i thought was yeah. so smart and brought the song to like the next level for me mm. i i really like the opening i think the opening is very strong that <laughs> deep deep low rumbling <laughs> Yeah, I like that. And I actually like how the first chorus that you mentioned, it plays with like the sharp four and the natural four. It's da 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 It goes sharp mm-hmm. and then natural and then goes downwards. Yeah, I like that. It's it's really spicy. And then, yeah, with the thing that, that it juxtaposes later. Da 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 da. But man, overall, the song, <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of it. Wasn't your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it, it fell to it, it fell into a little bit of on the repetitive side for me. It's kind of a tr- it's a tricky thing when you um when you choose to do a hook that doesn't necessarily have that sort of obvious lift to it, mm. notationally speaking. Uh, there was a song earlier I think we were talking about. I forgot which one it was. I think it was Strangers, that mm. had that sort of like playing it low, the uh, mm. the chorus, and I think that was well executed. Famous. Maybe it didn't have that that pop that it needed, um, but I think they were going for a different kind of energy. To me, it has a really uh, has a really classic K-pop energy to it. Um, yeah, a lot it of, does. Yeah, and I think That's there's right. especially the because of the chromaticism in the hook, you kind of see so that sort of um, not gimmick in a bad way. I don't want to say, mm-hmm. but like sort of that. That, that feeling of, oh, this kind of feels like that it had a throwback vibe to it to me. A little sorry, sorry going on. Yeah, or yeah. maybe even like um, some of the stuff that uh, the boy bands of the U.S. were doing uh, in like 98, 99. But, um, yeah. I like the whisper rapping in the second verse. I thought Tamer was... Oh, yes. For that. Oh, yes, really I good. like that. Yeah. You know how the slap bass and guitar just appears once in a while throughout the beginning right. of the track? And then the final chorus... They come yeah. out completely. Yeah, about that slap bass. You need. You should. You, you should finish your point first before I. Before I. <laughs> I thought it was just smart how you're hinting at so many things throughout, and then decide to go with it completely towards the mm. end, because even though it might be playing the same material that we've heard before in this song, it is a different texture. Yeah, I like. I definitely like the build up to like full slap at the end, but yeah. it felt like despite. The rhythm was groovy, I'll give it that. But it's not, it doesn't quite hit the funk spot. And with the with the slap bass, mm-hmm. I, I, I gotta feel the funk. And I don't think it quite became funk. Hmm. It, it wasn't funky enough. So the slap bass for me was like, oh, 
it's interesting that it's here, but it only remained interesting. It wasn't something that I totally warmed up to. Personally, I'm I guess I'm kind of a sucker for like groovy bass mm. lines, and I get what you're saying though about like the full on groove. It definitely still had the the pop feel mm-hmm. to it to me. It had um kind of reminded me it had some sort of MJ implications. Mm. So yeah. like another thing I'm a little weak for, but um. I what I thought was really unique was it had a uh, like a digital distortion to it mm. in the bass. You can kind of hear like a ringing on top of it anytime that the the sub of the bass actually hits. Huh. And I thought that was a really interesting approach because a lot of times when I'm producing at home, I try to avoid using or avoid find if I hear any instrumentation that has that weird digital grain, I I don't like mm-hmm. it. But I'd like that they mm-hmm. use it deliberately, like a, a purposeful distortion. The sprinkles on the cake was that. That kind of supports and then answers famous, famous rhythmically. It's almost, I guess, even da, 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 yeah, the just wing. the little bits yeah, of some... swung, yeah, percussion mm. throughout. I think just I, I don't, like, Kevin, you were saying that it wasn't funky enough for you, but I really don't think that was the point of the bass. I think it was just to add some extra hits mm-hmm. I... and coolness like i picture you know like fashion walk model walk walk oh. fashion baby yeah walk walk yeah. fashion baby yeah <laughs> yeah so these last two tracks were a little bit more groovy right mm-hmm. so when clockwork happened is oh. clockwork the next song already yeah oh my gosh so this one hit me hard really 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 emotionally mm-hmm. and it's Usually I can explain why, why something hits me emotionally, and I have a hard time explaining why this one gets me so much. Adrian, do you have any insight in the melody of why, <laughs> why um, it's so heartstring pulley? There's a... He's not, he's not locked into... Um, he's not locked into the tempo. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really good job. That's, that's uh, one of those things that... It's a useful... Um, approach to creating something that's a little bit more heartfelt and realistic because mm. if you're when you're singing on top of time um it's good to give you energy but if you're having uh like this kind of gives me a sense of like reminiscence right thinking mm-hmm. back about something and singing a little bit behind the beat deliberately which is why i think strings are so dramatic because a lot of times strings will play a little bit later than everything else um and that's a lot of that's due to like latency digital mm-hmm. latency <laughs> production <laughs> Um, but I think that I think that might have been a part of it. Um, the production is is absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. I think that the uh, the ticking clock on the six eight time signature was kind of was unique. I thought that was really cool. Uh, and I love absolutely love my favorite part of the song entirely is the second. I guess you can call it pre-chorus melody. What he does there is so incredible. I'm trying to like, because I, I just listened to it the one time, but I made a note of it deliberately because of how much I loved it. Da, 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 da. At the end, oh, that made, me, that made me just like, I got goosebumps from that because it was so, it was a good way to, to, to sort of release the energy that he was doing. Mm. And then coming down that melody like that to prepare for the chorus, it was just, it was, it was pro level writing to me. Yeah, how how the first half of the song was sung on the back of the beat and quieter, and then the second half is just letting it loose. That's really when the waterworks started going Mm. for me. And it's so funny because usually, even ballads, I tend to approach technically, and I'm like, okay, how is the harmony working? Is it repetitive? Is it using all the tropes? And this is one that is very repetitive, uh, chord wise harmonically but I don't think it pulls on like any of the tropes that we hear most often in Korean ballads mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. because it is able to convey so much emotion without those tropes well, I mean I guess it like it adds in percussion but it doesn't add in percussion another ballad in a way that another ballad would we have these woo, wow weird technical almost uh, oh dystopian. yeah those are really cool they those were there from the beginning <sighs> There was little... No original. way. Oh, no. Maybe really? we're talking about something else. I thought else. they were added... Because I remember there was a piano, and then soon uh-huh. after, the second thing that caught my ears were the... That that type of sound. There was like little, a reverse cymbal But almost. then there's like... Woo, oh. That comes in later. I see. So I guess like they kind of like start sprinkling in the... Yeah, for sure. Stuff. I like, I like the, I like the like, special like, effects. Yeah. 
Um, mm-hmm. What I think this song does extremely well is that sometimes, sometimes there are songs where when it gets to the chorus, I felt like they need a bit more oomph. They, that there needs to be mm. more going on and that's there's another song mm. where that's exactly my criticism that's coming later but this song i felt like it was very smart that they kind of reverted back to what the verses sounded like there are some slight changes but it felt like from the pre-chorus to the chorus there was a level down but it it made it sound more vulnerable it made it, different things were brought out once the chorus hit and i really really like mm. it and I also just really like the piano in that. It's so it's so gorgeous. It reminded me of um, it was a it reminded me of early twentieth century French composers, and to oh. to specifically name two, uh, Mio Darius Mio and Francis Poulenc. Oh yeah, Poulenc. especially the way they write piano chords. Yeah, it's like Me kind like of it. impressionistic, but not completely. This feels like the flip side of Strangers because both have like. Um, more static type of piano riff, one that you don't usually mm. hear. And so, yeah, this is where I think, yeah, the structure of the album is very strong. It's like there's on each half of the album, there's this, there's this piano heavy, piano centric uh, song. I guess the Strangers is more upbeat, but the uh, Clockwork is more like a ballad. But mm-hmm. they both, yeah, like what I like about Clockwork is no matter how deep into the song it got, I could always hear that piano. And it was very much the center, the soul, uh, the heart of the, the song. And I think Strangers had a similar effect. And I like that. The mirroring. Yeah. yeah. The fact yeah, that, that this cool. song is so circular, it just feels like the progression is looping back on itself and it's so meaningful. It was so, mm-hmm. so much on purpose. Mm-hmm. And this was this was the emotional peak of the album for me, wow. and so for the rest of the album, I kind of needed time to recover. But was there anything else that you wanted to talk about with Clockwork, Adrian? Um, I just think that um, toward the end, I loved that he had a moment to just sort of express with big open notes before going into the, the final, you know, the final moment. It was just really cool to just have this sort of moment to release. The piano was playing, and he was like singing as if expressing sadness you know his his uh the long notes you know that i thought that was really great mm. um yeah made yeah. me feel good speaking of the end <laughs> i think the last note of the song is a little misplaced on purpose <laughs> don don but it just oh yeah i thought it was a kind of like a See, I didn't think it was a retardando. I didn't think he was slowing it down. I thought it was a genuine, just a misplaced note, almost like the the clockwork. This this headspace, this heart space that he's in, like he has to wake up. There's that feeling of oh, reality's different. So okay, the next song, ooh, the is that a vocoder? What they have? Ooh, bah, 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 bah. Ooh. No, it wasn't a vocoder. It's something different than a vocoder. I just imagine someone like playing audio on their phone and then go wah, 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 wah on it. You know, like the sound effect that you do when you cover up sound and then open it up. Right. That could be that could be a number of things, actually. But there are a lot of uh, effects parameters and a lot of these uh, soft synths that will do that. Um, Kind of part of almost like um, an arpeggiator almost. But to put that sort of like it plays with the EQ a little Mm -hmm. bit, kind of warps it. Mm. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that yeah. effect. Something about the album in general that I actually really enjoy is um, I think there are very good rhythmic fills, like drum fills, but they're not always like played on real drums. But there are very good rhythmic fills on like the tail end of a section or like a four bar phrase. There's always like a dig 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 to lead us back in to it. And this one, this song had the timpani, this yeah. big, wide timpani. Now, where the issue, <laughs> where the issue lies with that is, I feel like, so the timpani happens at the end of the pre-chorus. Once the chorus hits, I feel like the sound that was hinted at for a split second with the timpanis, it wasn't, it, it, it didn't, it didn't blossom enough for me. I thought it was, it mean, it, it, it narrowed back down. And this was the song that I mentioned just now in Clockwork, where like I felt like the, it, the chorus needed a bit more, either a bit more reverb or a bit more lower frequencies or something yeah Mm. so perhaps maybe like a a higher note in the chorus at the initial note um in the chorus i thought it was good it actually reminded me a lot the pre-chorus into chorus has a um 
again, we're comparing again. People are going to be so Let's mad. Let's go. Let's do but, it. Uh, <laughs> if you go back and listen to Omarion's Icebox, um, produced by Timbaland, Danger Hands, all those guys, hmm. they have, um, it's a, um, da, 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 the major, major, major into a, a minor, ascending chord progression. And so this does the same thing. And what's interesting about that song, Omarion starts his chorus, Icebox, on the same note relative to the chords that are going on. So um, <clears throat> there's a really uh, strong likeness to that. And I loved Icebox. So because it reminded me of that song in a lot of ways, and it's not it's not exactly like it. I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like it's ripping anything off because it's not. It has its own entire sort of feel to it. First of all, it's a completely different tempo. Um, the time signature kind of plays triplets a little bit more. Um, the song, I should say, plays a triplets a lot more than Icebox does. But uh, I'd love to see a performance with this one mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Um, I know how Taman moves uh, a certain way. I feel like this would really give him a chance to sort of do his sort of expressive movements. Mm-hmm. I um, think under a live live sound, I think the chorus would would blossom more as well. I think it would mm-hmm. fit would fit better as far as my criticisms of the song are because yeah. of the groove of the song oh. because of the soundscape even even with the very dramatic build in the pre-chorus to kind of settle into this lower groove it was such a nice gentle it's like as if i was like standing on the edge of a cliff I, <laughs> during clockwork and then someone during the song took my hand and led me away from the edge of that mm. I thought it was a very gentle let down emotionally because you can definitely feel a lot going on in this song as well but it's less as raw and, than clockwork I feel like so this was the perfect mm. me recovering from my emotions while still enjoying you know what's happening yeah and, yeah yeah it had like a sense of hope to it mm. whereas Icebox had like sort of like a stress to it like uh this is this is all i have left like this is like this destruction where this gives you hope it's so interesting that with the same chord progression in that at least in that moment it gives you a completely different conveyance of feeling wow okay let's move on to nemo the runs the runs the vocal oh, yeah. runs oh, r&b <laughs> This is R and B. It is R and B. It's very R and B. Another song where he lets loose, both physically and vocally. This song, yes, it is R and B through and through. But for me, there, there isn't, there isn't any more. And I know it's very selfish of me to want more. It didn't really keep me invested through its entire runtime. Hmm, even and with I, the additional vocal twists right, and I tr- turns? I tried to latch on to the vocals. I tried, you know, I listened to every aspect of it, but it just, hmm. I wasn't able to, yeah, be along along with it. Gotcha, yeah. For me, it was it was really the vocals that took it away because, mm. and even the, I'm, I guess I'm just not as familiar with the R&B genre, but the bridge where we adventured into different harm, harmonic there's a, areas. There's a, cool, cool, there's a cool harmonic section going on there, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you where exactly we went. <laughs> so it, the the song is very much in D, and then all of a sudden you get like an E minor add seven going on, mm-hmm. and then just kind of it just kind of wiggles back, which is actually yeah. Though every time that happens, it's like really impressive. It really it's really awesome. I, I like how and I like how his vocal melodies work around that too. It's just really mm. f- fun to hear how that all works out. But yeah, that but that also brings out how the rest of the song for me just didn't have that same type of grip. The grip, yeah. I think it's you make a good point, Umu, in that it it's definitely vocally focused. I think something really cool happens in the second verse. Uh, he gets to go in a lot of cool places. I know the chords get a little more uh, tricky on that second in the second verse, and I love how he sort of. I'm a big fan of finding a melody that goes through a lot of sort of tricky chord progressions. Um, I think, Kevin, I think I understand what you mean by it, because it, it doesn't give off the amount of dynamic that maybe you would want to hear mm. um, in a song like this. But I, I think it's, to me, what I really kind of latched on to was his ability to go in a lot of different directions. Mm. And again, I didn't really know Taman was capable of this. 
Yeah. Personally. Yeah, I didn't know. So I, I, this to me, I was excited because I'm seeing the growth of Taman as the artist and kind of seeing, oh, I, he does this, he does that. I know there was a lot of things that he was timid with. I remember um, some things I was really excited to pitch and they're like, well, we don't really know if this was a fit for him for whatever reason. But I think he's he's expanding even more. He's evolving as an artist. Mm. And this is kind of one of those. To, I, I'm pretty sure he's done R&B before. In fact, I know he has. But this is kind of on um, a different level in terms of vocal acrobatics. Yeah, mm. exactly. And and he, he I think he executed pretty well. The overall song, you know, that's debatable. But uh, I do like his sort of uh, attack. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Especially when you hear him nail it in the live. That was even more shocking for oh, me. Oh, yeah. Because... He, yeah. And then, Kevin, I'm not sure if I reached you in time with the fact that Two Kids was actually a pre release. So this was released before everything else. But it also was, for me, a perfect end to the album because I needed something a little bit hopeful. I needed something to get my energy up a little bit, maybe a tiny bit bittersweet with that minor chord um, that that comes in once in a while. And I thought this was a really good s- ending, even even though it's so interesting that he started with it initially, but then they decided to put it at the end. But it was a smart choice, end. nonetheless. Hmm. I, I Okay, well, let me start. Let me preface this by uh, saying that I am aware of like the YouTube views on the song and that it's it's rather low you know for something that Taman has done so it kind of shows that not a lot of people were a fan of the song um and i think a lot of it had to do with the fact that and i could be wrong i don't know maybe uh kevin if you have a different insight on it, i'd love to hear but it kind of felt like it was maybe too much of a segue from what you would expect from Taman. from Taman, yeah. yeah or it maybe just k-pop artists in general i don't know but from Taman, uh for sure but and again, I could be wrong about this, but I feel like that that song is going to be one of the ones that will stand the test of time in, t- in terms of uh, you'll hear it in like grocery stores, you'll hear it like in shopping malls and stuff like that. It's going to it's one of those ones that they can come back to mm. um, the playbacks. And I and I do again. Also, I love that they they chose to end this one for the album because it does give a sensation of like longing, uh, almost as if to say musically that this is to be continued. Um, yeah. so I think at least it gave that sort of feeling off for me. Is it, would it be something that I would listen to? It's not necessarily like my style, but I love what was done in the song, um, for whatever that's worth. The fact that it was released in between Super M100 and Super M Tiger inside, right in between. So he had no time to promote it at all. I know that Shawls were talking about that. Quite yeah, a bit. true. Mm. It felt like the beginning of the song was going for almost like a rock band, a pop rock. The mute guitar. Yeah, mute kind of, guitar. Yeah. Even I think there were some sparse percussion, I can't remember, but at least there were hints of it. Like it was going to build up to something. The thing is, I found when the chorus came, that main drop, all the percussion that happened at the bottom, it felt like everything was kind of just, just splashed loose. around. Very oh, loose Oh, that's what I me. liked about it. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. I, I, I caught on with some of the lyrics because with these MVs, you know, some the subtitles just turn Thank automatically turn on. Um... Yeah. I like <laughs> the idea of, you know, the two kids. And they're like there's a pun on like, I, was it like I too was, I was too young, right? Too young two kids, and two, two kids. Too young and dumb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. But I... Maybe it's just my own expectations, but I felt like it needed more of like a drum set type of very punchy, very precise mm-hmm. type of thing. So then later on, you know, when the snaps came in, I was like, oh, the snaps are cool. And then there was like some other percussion that happened in like a transition section. I'm like, oh, that percussion is cool. But then every time mm-hmm. the chorus came, it just, I kept, okay, I'm going to say it. This is a word that I didn't want to say the whole time. I thought it was sloppy. Oh. I think that's... Yeah. That's the, yeah, it, I... it sounds it sounds free to me, mm. and that's what you know. These type of songs I would associate with a summer song, kind of like almost tropical. You can picture like a giant swooping nature shot of the forest or of the beach, and just soaring through the sky. You know, warm weather, sunlight. Mm. That's what I pictured with this song, and just the the warmth that it gave me. Mm. And I thought that ta 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 ta, and the layers of it, 
if you watch him dancing, there's, you know, like a lot of giant spins face upwards and very big motions. And mm. I thought that the, the percussion and everything else was just like, it's a release and like almost like a pat on the back. Like, hey, it's going to yeah. be okay. For me, this sounds like parkouring on rooftops. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I, um, I wonder, because Kevin, I was thinking about your, your critique on it, and I wonder if... If they were to build percussion on the course to kind of give you that lift, would it take away from the sort of reminiscence of what he was conveying? Right. And that's a, that's a definitely an interesting balance. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a difficult one to pull off, I think, if you were to really like kind of bring it up. Because I, I see what you mean. When you did add that percussion, it kind of made me focus on some of the backing vocals that happened um, there as well. Mm. And I noticed that they had a really cool sort of vocoder harmonization going on with his lead vocal because those those vocals weren't you could tell they weren't didn't have a natural sort of texture to them so you knew that it was i'm pretty sure it's a vocoder i'm not 100 yeah sure. i second that um but i thought that was kind of a neat sort of texture something that you didn't hear in this album anywhere else and it kind of brought out a new sort of uh flavor all right let's let's do our final comments so this was the perfect emotional journey for me. It, it had really good ups and downs, and like Adrian said, it flowed nicely. But like I mentioned before, it probably was really obvious which my favorite song was, which is Clockwork, because I just, wow. I felt mm. so much emotion through his singing, and mm. it really touched me. Again, I think that it was a really very well put together collection of music, and um, I was really impressed with the order of things. I'm, I'm one of those people that like to listen to it. I don't like to shuffle because mm. I feel like there is an intent um, on sort of the journey through the album. I'll shuffle it up after I've done it the one or two times, but I want to kind of get a sense because I think there's a song in the playthrough as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that there was some genius thinking. I, I know there's a lot of uh, meticulous work. I can tell that Taman really put a lot of focus in each and every one of these songs and i think they all complement each other very well so to me this is a type of album that i would study continuously um for a lot of reasons you know mostly positive maybe a couple things that aren't my favorite but that's that's very few for me um but i thought i think it was great i love the single and um my favorite song would probably be strangers though it just when those keys and the chords came in the piano at the beginning, that just, that did it for me. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. And his soft sort of vocal coming in um, is a very well initial setup for me to just be like, yep, this is it. I like it. All right. I obviously I'm the most critical one of the album out of the three <laughs> of us. But um, yeah, I, I, I do admire, I do admire the um, ordering of the tracks. I do think that's very nice. My favorite would be the title track. Right. And then it will be Black Rose. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And then, oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention that Black Rose went Dorian for a little <laughs> bit. That B major. I love it. Are you talking about the pre-chorus or? It was, yeah, pre-chorus. The shift, pre -chorus. very last That little, chorus. little, little chord. Yeah, which is yeah. really sick. Yeah. So it would be that. <laughs> it would be title track, Black Rose, and then Clockwork, and then closely followed by Strangers, and then the rest oh. of the album. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. I, I get it, though. I get that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Adrian's such a good job on Black Rose. I'm going to go back and listen Thank to it with much. knowing how you approached writing it, knowing that it's kind of inspired by a, a video game and Danny Elfman right. and picturing it through that scenery. And I think I'll be mm -hmm. able to enjoy it to a whole new Think level. about, like, I'm Nightmare excited. Before Christmas and, yes. like, a gravestone with a Black Rose sitting on top of it with, uh, with autumn oh, leaves nice. falling and twigs everywhere and a gray sky, and that's pretty much where I was. That's so cool. Thank you so much for your time, Adrian. This was loads of fun. I thought you added a lot to Absolutely. our post discussion. And I loved hearing it from a songwriter's point of view and approaching the melody and when trying we have less to than a, a certain we mood. Might have to... I got you. Certain okay. mood in the album, <laughs> that's why you choose to do certain things, so boom! Yes, thank Bye. you all, Thank you so much. We have less than a minute, but I think you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Yes.